Can I have two from the top, please? You certainly can. And your target, 582. Okay, so if you're from outside the UK, you might not be familiar with Countdown. It's a sleepy British game show in which contestants do some boring word games before putting their numeracy skills to the test in a devilishly simple yet enduring game. They get six game numbers to work with and a three digit target number. The game is to use the game numbers to reach the target number. You can only use each copy of each game number once, you don't have to use every number, you can only use the four basic arithmetic operations, and you can use any numbers you make along the way in the same way as the original numbers. This is an example solution to this game up here. Here is another solution, but there are many more. See if you can find them. And by the way, the resident mathematician on Countdown is Rachel Riley. And before that, the co-host that I grew up with, Carol Vorderman. But here's what I want to know. Are all target numbers achievable? What's the most difficult target to achieve and why? And there's another element to the game I haven't mentioned yet, and that's at the start of the numbers round, the contestant gets to choose how many large numbers to include in their game set. The rest of the set is filled up with small numbers. What's the optimal amount of large numbers? Is there an overall winning strategy? And what is going on in this episode? So many questions, and I was surprised at how counterintuitive many of the answers are. So join me in this mathematical analysis of Countdown, Britain's longest running game show. I have a bit of a confession to make. I love game shows. I love them so much. It's one of the only aspects of British culture with which I wholeheartedly and unapologetically identify. I mean, I also unapologetically love tea and fish and chips, but still, I love games, I love quizzes, I love puzzles, and here in the UK we have so many game shows that exist for the sheer thrill of the game. Sure, we have the cash-based games, but even they have spun into fascinating formats. We have those that reward lateral thinking, as in the case of Catchphrase, based on an American show which got cancelled in the US, but we Brits lapped it up. There are those with a bit of underlying game theory, like in The Weakest Link. And we even have shows that glamorise knowledge, like in The Chase. Even in the celebrity world, we have panel shows that exist to mock politics, like Have I Got News For You, panel shows that exist to mock each other, like Would I Lie To You, even panel shows that exist to be fun games to themselves like Richard Osman's House of Games to you, which I love but kind of resent for its gatekeeping. Why only allow celebrities on your fun show, Richard? What if I want to play? But my favourites are those that exist just for the hell of it. We have shows like Pointless, which ingeniously crosses broad appeal with esoteric knowledge, the prize fund being a paltry £1,000 per episode and even that is split between two people. We have the cryptic Only Connect, which doesn't even offer a prize. Same with the unabashedly academic University Challenge, the only quiz where you'll find questions about actual mathematics. A scalar lambda for which there exists a non-zero vector v such that m multiplied by v equals lambda times v. Venezuela. <laughs> and that's an eigenvalue. That is, of course, except for Countdown. This is one of the UK's oldest and longest running game shows with a format that's been broadly unchanged since it first aired 41 years ago in 1982. It should be noted Countdown didn't invent the format. It's actually based on a French show creatively titled Letters and Numbers. Countdown is another show that, in the British tradition, exists primarily for the glory of winning. Although there are prizes, like for beating a series champion, you take home, and I'm not joking, a countdown themed teapot. Because, of course. This show is a British institution. The 30 second timer music is etched into my brain, including the iconic, quaint yet anxiety inducing final few seconds. <laughs> We love quizzes and panel shows so much that there's even a panel show variant of Countdown. As a child, I loved Carol Vorderman's quick arithmetic and how it made being mathematically astute seem desirable. Of course, we all know that this kind of numeracy isn't really mathematics, and that being good at mathematics and being good at mental arithmetic are often two different things. But it played a small part in my mathematical journey, and for that, I'll always be grateful. Still, there are proper mathematics questions lurking in this game, and those are as always, the general ones. What are the patterns, the optimizations, the tactics?
First, let me set the stage for those who don't have precise knowledge of the rules. I appreciate that if you're from outside the UK, you might never have seen Countdown before, and your only exposure to this game was in school when your math teacher decided to reward you with a game. The first thing the contestant does is select which numbers they can use in the game. For the rest of this video, I'm going to call these the game numbers, and the collection of six game numbers I'll call the game set. The game numbers are split into two categories. First we have the large numbers, these are 25, 50, 75 and 100. The first thing the contestant does is they choose how many random large numbers to include in their game set. So for example, if they choose two large numbers, then Rachel will draw two random large numbers and include those in the game set. The rest of the game set is filled up with random small numbers for a total of six game numbers. The small numbers are made up of two copies each of the integers from one to 10. So in this example, Rachel draws four random small numbers to complete the set. Then a random number generator spits out a target number. This can be any integer from 100 to 999. The generator is nicknamed Cecil because of course we named it. And that stands for Countdown's Electronic Calculator in Leeds. It's also named in honor of Cecil Cora, the veteran TV producer who originally commissioned the show. Because 100 is one of the possible game numbers, then 100 is the only target number that you can achieve without any calculation. And that happened in the 8 out of 10 cats spoof of the show. Roisin, um, talk me through how you did it, because you looked a little bit panicked early on. There's 100 there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to leave that as is. <laughs> The first thing we want to know then is how many possible game sets are there? Now this is a fun counting puzzle if you want to have a crack at it yourself before I go through how I counted them. The thing that makes this a non-trivial problem is the existence of duplicates in the set of small numbers. So for example, if we look at the case where we have two large numbers, of which there are four choose two equals six options, then we can't just do 10 choose four to work out the number of options for these small numbers, as for example, that wouldn't count the cases where we have duplicates. We also can't just do 20 choose four, as that would overcount the cases without duplicates. So the easiest way I found of doing this is to consider a case by case basis. In the case where we have two large numbers, we require four small numbers to complete the set. We could either have two pairs of small numbers, one pair of small numbers, or no pairs of small numbers. In the case where we have two pairs of smalls, then there are only 10 choose two options for those two pairs. In the case where we have one pair of smalls, then there are 10 options for the pair, then the remaining two numbers must be different from the number used in the pair, as there are only two copies of each number. And because we only want one pair, these final two numbers must be distinct. So we are in effect choosing two numbers from a pool of nine. So we have 10 times nine choose two options. In the case where we have no pairs of small numbers, then we really are just choosing four distinct numbers from a pool of 10. So there are 10 choose four options. And don't forget all of this is happening in the case where we choose two large numbers and there are four choose two options for how to do that. So the number of game sets with two large numbers is given by all of this, which is 3,690. We can use a similar approach to count the cases with one large number. Consider the cases with two pairs of smalls, one pair of smalls and no pairs of smalls. A similar approach with no large numbers, considering the cases with three pairs, two pairs, one pair and no pairs of smalls. Again with three large numbers, considering the cases with one pair and no pairs of smalls. And finally with four large numbers. Note that if four large numbers are selected, then there is only one option for how those large numbers are configured. You just get all four of them. And for the smalls, consider the cases of one pair and no pairs of smalls. All in all, this gives us 13,243 possible game sets. I think there might be simpler ways for doing that count, so if you have another idea, let me know in the comments. But I found this way to be intuitive and easy to explain. Now, given that there are 900 possible target numbers, we can see that there are 900 times 13,243 equals 11,918,700 total possible games. At three numbers rounds per episode, five episodes per week, assuming a different configuration each time, the show wouldn't need to repeat a game until the year 17,262. That's if anyone is still around to watch. But even in the event of societal collapse, I'd be very disappointed if we Brits didn't find a way to keep Countdown running. 
Also, given that countdown hosts last an average of six and a half years, we would burn through another 2,350 hosts in that time. We would also go through another two mathematicians. So first, given a game set, are there some targets which are impossible to reach? Well, the answer is, almost trivially, yes. I mean, the worst game set you can draw is this one, double three, double two, double one. The highest number you can even make here is 81. So this set can actually reach no targets. Pathetic. But given a more typical game set, how many targets are achievable? We could answer this question in two ways. First, given a game set, go through each of the potential targets and check off whether they are reachable. You can do this with one of the many online calculators or you could program one yourself. I chose a different approach. I said, given a game set, forget about the targets being between 100 and 1000, how many possible reachable numbers are there with that game set? Again, this is another fun puzzle to work out how you might go about this, but I'll go through the way I did it here. This is how I thought about it. Every step in the computation is one of these four operations. These are all what we call binary operations, which means they take two inputs and give one output. So we start with a six element set and we use up two of the numbers. We're only allowed to use each number once, so they get removed from the set. So now we remove A and B from our set because we've used them and we're only allowed to use them once. But remember, we're allowed to use the result of this operation in future calculations. So we include the result in our set, giving us a five element set. And now we're going to rinse and repeat. So at each step, we choose two numbers, we delete them from the set, and then we do an operation with them and keep the result. So because each time we are removing two numbers and including a new one, the total number of elements will go down by one each time. No matter how crazy your calculation is, it can always be broken down this way because every operation takes two inputs and give one output. So with that in mind, how many possible calculations are there from a given game set? Well, first, a couple of clarifications. I'll always sort this set into descending order and do the operations with the large number first. That way, we won't repeat calculations through commutative operations like addition and multiplication. It also means we won't generate negative numbers through subtraction. The countdown rules expressly forbid the use of negative numbers. And in a similar way, they forbid the use of divisions which result in a non-integer. Since a divided by b is always a non-integer when a is less than b, doing the large number first in the division makes sense as well. Yes, some of the divisions will still be illegal, but we'll worry about that later. So how many possible calculations are there? Well, there are six choose two numbers for the first step, which can be combined through four different operations, five choose two for the next step, combined through four different operations, and so on down the line. And remember, we don't need to use every number in our calculation. So at each step, we are generating a potential target. But if we add all of them up, we get that there are 3,516,060 total possible calculations. Now, this is just a ballpark figure. Remember that some of these divisions will be illegal and that many of the numbers we generate along the way will be duplicates of each other. But there's no quick way to account for that. Most importantly, we are only interested in numbers between 100 and 999. So at every step in our calculation, we can ask if the number we generate is in that range and keep it in a solution set if it does meet that criterion. And this is the idea behind the Python script that I wrote to solve this problem. If you want to run the code yourself, you'll find a link to it in the description. One caveat, I am a mathematician, not a programmer. So please don't judge me for my horrendously inefficient and ugly code. It ran in about 90 minutes and that was quick enough for me. So are all targets reachable? Yes, given any target number, there exist many, many game sets which can reach that target. In fact, 1,226 game sets can reach any target. That's about 9% of the total number of game sets. Which target number is the most difficult to reach? An argument can be made for 947, which is reachable by only 9,017 of the total possible game sets, the fewest of any target number. But even that is about three quarters of all the possible game sets. As for which targets are easiest, the numbers 100, 102, 104, and 108 can all be reached by all but three of the game sets, 
only these ridiculously unlucky sets can't make those targets. This truly pathetic set of numbers here can't make any target, so of course it can't make those four numbers. Its slightly less useless older sibling, 43221, can't make these three targets. And its even less useless cousin, 53221 can't make these two targets. Things get a bit more interesting from here. This set can't actually reach 100. It's almost like the numbers are too large. We've lost some of the numerical fidelity. Every time we try to make 100, we end up skipping past it. It's a similar story with this set and this set, which can't make 108. Also note here that in these sets, we have lots of pairs of small numbers, which as we'll see shortly, is generally bad. Now, as you might expect, higher targets are reachable by fewer game sets. Below 500, nearly all targets are reachable by 90% of game sets. So if your game set is below 500, a solution is very likely to exist. As for what makes a good game set, well, the worst number to draw is a 1, and I think that's fairly intuitive. There's a couple of good reasons for this. The first is that usually each of the four operations will produce four different numbers. So take 5, for example. Adding 5, subtracting 5, multiplying by 5, and dividing by 5 will always result in four different numbers. However, with 1, multiplying by 1 and dividing by 1 are just wasted operations. So it reduces the overall reach of the set. 1 is also bad because it is small, and larger numbers tend to be better. Remember, the largest game number is 100, but the target numbers go all the way up to the 900s. So if you want to access the high targets, you need high numbers in order to get there. So if 1 is the worst number to draw, which number is the best? And here, I don't think the answer is quite as obvious or intuitive. This table shows the average number of reachable targets among all game sets which happen to contain the number on the left. Take this row here for example, among all game sets which happen to contain at least one copy of the number 3, you can expect to reach 819 targets, which is pretty good, that's about 90% of them. Now as we can see, larger numbers tend to do better, with 1 being significantly worse than the rest of them. In this regard, 7 and 9 are the best small numbers, because the game sets which include at least one of those can reach on average 842 different targets, which is most of them. But why? 7 and 9. That kind of defied my intuition, I don't know about you, but I think there's two reasons why these numbers are so good. The first is that they are large, and as we've already discussed, large small numbers tend to do better, but also there's something to do with the priminess, and we're going to discuss this a little bit more detail later, but 7 is itself prime, and 9 contains two copies of the prime 3, and that turns out to be good. First, let's look at how the pairs of small numbers do. So this table shows the average number of reachable targets among all game sets which happen to contain the pair of small numbers on the left. So again, let's look at that third row. Among all game sets which contain both threes, the average number of reachable targets is only 775. So as we discussed earlier, pairs of small numbers tend to do worse. And again, I think it's fairly intuitive as to why, because with one of your small numbers, you can go in four different directions, but if you've got another copy of that small numbers, you're kind of repeating the action that that other small number affords you. So it kind of limits the overall reach of the set. So as we can see, game sets with pairs of small numbers tend to do worse, with a pair of nines being the best pair of small numbers that you can draw. And what should we be doing with these small numbers? What's the overall strategy? Well, annoyingly, there isn't a consistent approach that's good in every single situation. But I will talk you through a few of the tactics that I see in many of my computer-assisted solutions and that the strong players on the show tend to use. The most common tactic is what we call the pitch and put. This involves taking a multiple of the large number, that's the pitch, and then adjusting it to get to your target number. That's the put. The pitch can often be improved by adjusting the large number before multiplying. Let me show you an example. So let's say we've drawn these numbers and we're trying to make 618. Now, anyone who plays countdown knows their 75 times table, and they know that 75 times 9 equals 675, which is pretty close. We're only about 60 away. And since we're about 60 away, we also observe that 7 times 9 is 63, and we'd like to subtract that. But we're only allowed to use the 9 once. However, 
if we subtract 7 from 75 before multiplying by 9, that will correspond to deducting 7 lots of 9 from this total here. Notice that I never carried out the subtraction to get 68, and I didn't carry out the multiplication by 9 to get the answer of 612, I just used distributivity. It's for that reason that sometimes the answers on the show look more elaborate than they actually are, because of how these solutions have to be presented one step at a time. Now, after this pitching stage, I'm 6 away from my target number, but I've got a 5 and a pair of 2s left for the putting stage, and I can make 6 with those numbers by either doing 5 plus 2 divided by 2, or 5 subtract 2 or times 2. It's because of this that larger small numbers tend to fare better. Imagine you wanted to carry out this pitch, but your only small numbers were 1, 2, and 3. Well, to do 9 times 75, you would have to make 9 using all three of these numbers, doing 1 plus 2 all times 3. But now you've used all your small numbers in the pitching stage, you don't have any flexibility in the putting stage. But if one of your small numbers was like the number 9, then 75 times 9 just gets there in one step because the number nine just turns up and gets the job done, you know? The other technique that I see in a lot of my computer-assisted solutions is the use of convenient prime factorizations. Take this game here, for example, where we're trying to make 451. It isn't that easy. However, what if I told you that 451 as a product of primes is 11 times 41? Well, now all of a sudden it's really easy because we know six plus five is 11, and 25 plus 9 plus 7 make 41. Sometimes it's good to use prime factorizations which are close to the target number. A great example of this is if we try to make the next target number 452 with the same game set. This time I'm going to tell you that the prime factorization of 448 is 2 to the power 6 times 7, which is 64 times 7. Now this is 4 away from the target, so let's just pretend we don't have that because we're going to use it at the end. We've already got the 7 there, so now the game becomes can we make 64 with the remaining 4 numbers. And once you think about it for a little while, you'll see how we can do it. Now the problem with this as a general strategy where humans are concerned is that prime factorizations are quite chaotic. I reckon with a bit of practice and some memorization, you can get your hands on the prime factorization of the target number fairly quickly. There's usually a short interval between the target number being rolled and the clock starting, so you can use that time, that short window of time, to actually get that prime factorization. But if you want, like this example, to use a prime factorization that's close to the target, you might wind up having to do two or four different prime factorizations, and that eats up a lot of time. So I'll be honest, I don't know how effective this approach is for humans, but the computer seems to really like it. And this is why I think 9 and 7 are particularly strong small numbers. So look at this. If we've got a large number, they are all a multiple of 5. So they're all going to contain a factor of 5, and half of them are even, so they contain a factor of 2. Now 7 is the only game number which contains a factor of 7, and then if we include 9 in our game set, we have two 3s. So with just these numbers, we have all the primes below 10. Now the vast majority of numbers in the target range will contain at least one of these prime factors. So it really helps your pitch if you have access to all of these primes. Something that does work for humans, and you see this on the show all the time, is if your target number happens to be a multiple of one of the small numbers. So let's take the example 665 and we'll stick with the same game numbers. Now this is actually a multiple of 7. Now this drastically reduces the complexity in the game, because now you have 5 numbers to work with and all you need to do is make 95, which you can do with 25 times 4 subtract 5. Now the only issue with discussing tactics and optimal small numbers is that these small numbers are random. The only degree of control afforded to the contestant is in how many large numbers they choose to form part of their game set. So how do the large numbers fare? As it turns out, there's a happy medium in the amount of large numbers you should choose if you want to try and make any target. According to the Countdown Wiki, the most common approach on the show is to use one large number with five small numbers. Of the 1,226 game sets which can reach any target, 614 are in the one large five small category. That's just over half. Just under half are in the two large four small category with 603 such sets. Curiously, there are only five game sets with no large numbers which can reach any target. 
these are these ones. As you can see, they all prefer numbers on the larger end of things, with 10, 9, 8, and 7 appearing in all five of them. There are only four game sets with three large numbers, which can reach any target, and they are these ones. 9 again remains king, appearing in three of the four. So it seems like there are drawbacks in taking so many large numbers. Indeed, there are no possible game sets which contain all four large numbers which can reach every target. If you draw four large, you are guaranteeing that no matter which small numbers come out, there are some targets that you cannot make. So does that mean that we should never draw four large numbers? Actually, no. And if you've watched Countdown, you've probably noticed this in higher level play. There is a tendency for strong players to prefer the four large approach. And why is that? Well, there are two answers, and the first comes down to how the game is scored. Now, we haven't talked about this yet, but this is where a bit of game theory comes in. After the game set is drawn and the target number is rolled, contestants get 30 seconds to make their best attempt at achieving the target number. Let's say that I'm playing against this idiot in the yellow t-shirt and we are trying to reach the number 582. I managed to get 581, while the yellow guy only gets 584. The rules of the game are that only the contestant whose result is closest to the target scores points, and it doesn't matter whether you're under or over. If both contestants are the same distance to the target, then they both score. I'm one away, so I get the points and the yellow guy gets nothing. If you hit the target, it's 10 points. If you miss by a margin of 1 to 5, it's 7 points. If you miss by a margin of 6 to 10, it's 5 points. Missing the target by a margin greater than 10 scores nothing and is so shameful, they break your countdown teapot in front of you and your family. So that's the key. The game isn't always to reach the target, but the game is always to get closer to the target than your opponent. Even scoring 7 points while your opponent scores 0 is good. Fans of two-player games will know this. Any opportunity to gain points while depriving your opponent of the chance to score represents a decent swing. And you actually see this on the show all the time. If the scores are about level, or someone is behind, there is a tendency for that player to either choose four large numbers or no large numbers, as they represent the more challenging games. What they're trying to do is beat their opponent so that they score and deprive their opponent of the chance to score, thereby either catching up or establishing a lead. The opposite is also true as well. If someone is already ahead, then there is a tendency for them to choose one or two large numbers as they are the easier categories. Even if both players make the target and both score 10 points, they still retain the lead. The second advantage of the four large category is that there are only 55 possible game sets in this category. With all the other amounts of large numbers, there are over a thousand different configurations. So this is the only category in which it is realistic that you can practice every possible configuration. If you can enter the game having done lots of practice in the four large category, chances are you're going to be able to beat your opponent. And as it turns out, while there are no game sets with four large that can reach every target, the average distance to a given target to the best attempt is a mere 0.2. So nearly always, you're going to be able to either make the target or get within one of the target, thereby reliably scoring you 10 or 7 points. As a brief aside, there are some techniques which can help in the four large category. So as I already mentioned, choosing four large numbers really reduces the randomness in the game set. You can go in knowing that you have those four numbers to work with. So you can plan some of your moves out in advance. So one technique is the famous 937.5 trick. This is the simple observation that 75 multiplied by 25 divided by 100 on 50 is 937.5. The idea being that you add or subtract some odd number to this numerator before dividing and that allows you to access numbers in the 900s. Another common approach is to multiply by 50, 75 or 100 and then divide by 25 at the end. In effect, this allows you to create a 2, a 3, and a 4 wherever you need them. There are a couple of great examples of this in the latest Countdown Final, where Rachel uses this technique in her solutions. These solutions are impressive, but they look more elaborate than they really are, because what's really going on is we're cancelling the 25. These multiplications don't actually need to be carried out, because we know we're dividing by 25 at the end. This is perhaps the most famous numbers game ever. Multiplied by 3. 300. And 18. Um, I'd like to multiply by 75 now. Multiply it by 75? Yes, please. Um, multiply this by 75? Yes, please. Um, and then divide it by something? Well, yes, in a minute, but... <laughs> okay, <laughs> <that should be. laughs> 
I'm not quite oh. sure what that makes, but that's certainly what I... I've actually 318 times 75. 23,850, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now take away 50. 23,800. And divide by 25, I hope. Do you know, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and while I'm not denying that it's an impressive solution, it is, especially produced under the pressure of being on the show, the way the solution is presented makes it look far more elaborate than it really is. He knows that 100 times 9 is 900, which is quite good, but he also knows that 6 times 9 is 54, which gets him extremely close. So he knows he needs to do 106 multiplied by 9 and then subtract 2. To multiply by 9, we need to multiply by 3 twice. We've already got one 3 in our game set, so we just need to produce an extra 3 and an extra 2. But as we've discussed, we can always find a 3 and a 2 wherever we need them using the large numbers. Instead of multiplying by 3, we'll just multiply by 75 over 25. And instead of subtracting 2, we'll just subtract 50 over 25. But we know how fractions work, we can just divide by 25 at the end, so that we only use the 25 once. The downside to going in fully armed with the four large strategy is that you probably want to be well practiced at the other categories, because your opponent gets to choose the numbers in half of the numbers rounds. Oh, did you think we were done? No. What's going on in this episode? Well, this is an advanced version of the numbers round used in 2009 and 2010 specials featuring series champions. They replaced the usual large numbers with 12, 37, 62, and 87. And that got me thinking, sure, those numbers look nastier than the traditional nice and round 25, 50, and so on, but do they actually make the target numbers more difficult to achieve? If not, why not? And if the producers really wanted to test their series champions, how should they configure the large numbers? So the way I went about solving this was to consider all options of four large numbers. The challenging numbers seem to follow the precedent that the difference between successive numbers should still be 25, so I followed that precedent in my solution. Essentially, each set of potential large numbers is of the form n, n plus 25, n plus 50, n plus 75, where n is an integer from 11 to 25. Using n equals 25 gives the traditional large numbers, and n equals 12 gives the challenging ones. So we have 15 options for our set of large numbers, and here's how I figured out which ones yield more challenging games. For each set of large numbers, we construct all game sets which include at least one large number. Remember, we're filling up with the standard small numbers, and we don't care about the game sets which are composed entirely of small numbers, as obviously they're going to be the same regardless of the set of large numbers. There are 10,393 game sets which contain at least one large number. And now, since there are 900 targets, that gives us 9,353,700 possible configurations of game set and target. All I did was run through each of these 9,353,700 configurations to see what percentage of them result in a solvable game. And then I did that for each of the 15 options of large numbers. And the results I found to be really quite counterintuitive until you think about it. Here they are. So this graph shows the percentage of possible games among game sets which contain one large number. Here we can see that, generally speaking, larger numbers are better. And I think that's for similar reasons we discussed earlier. Things get more interesting from here though. This line shows results for game sets with two large numbers. We can see clear dips here. These are the large numbers where all of them are a multiple of five. These dips are more pronounced on this line, the game sets containing three large numbers. Notice here that usually three large are better than two. If you recall, for the traditional large numbers, two large was better, but that's not the case for the majority of other options of large numbers, where three large is usually better. We'll get to why shortly. And notice as well that for three large, the smaller sets of numbers tend to do better, which is the reverse of what we saw earlier. These trends are even more exaggerated when looking at sets of four large numbers, where the multiples of five perform terribly, and small sets really outperform the large ones. On the whole, the set 1944-6994 performs the best out of all choices of large numbers. With that collection of large numbers, you are overall most likely to be able to achieve any given target. And which large numbers perform the worst among all selections of large numbers? 
25, 50, 75 and 100, the traditional collection of large numbers. I thought this was interesting and really defied my intuition. Why are the nastier numbers able to reach more targets? Why do we see those trends? Well, I haven't proved this, but I don't think it's a coincidence that the sets of numbers which perform worse tends to be the ones where the numbers have lots of common factors. Taking two large is always better than one large because then you have two options for pitching up to high targets. But having common factors in your large numbers is bad because then the sets of all multiples overlap and reduce the overall reach of the set. That's why for sets with lots of common factors, taking more large numbers actually reduces your chances of being able to make targets because you've lost some of the flexibility in your small numbers in the putting stage while you haven't really gained any extra pitching numbers. But for sets without many common factors, the benefit in increasing the number of new multiples you can pitch to seems to outweigh the cost of reducing the flexibility in the small numbers. We can see this by looking at these diagrams reminiscent of the sieve of Eratosthenes. Here we have all the integers from 100 to 999. Now I'm going to highlight all the multiples of 11, 36, 61 and 86. That's the first of the options for how the large numbers are configured. Quite a few multiples, but as we look at the next collection of large numbers, fewer numbers are highlighted, and that trend continues until the traditional large numbers, which we can see perform terribly in this regard. We can see that the smaller large numbers really hit a lot of targets, so taking more large numbers really gives you a chance of making more precise pitches. If you graph the number of multiples of a given set of large numbers, it matches very well with the success rate of that set, when you take four large numbers. The benefit of having a wide range of multiples really shines through. As for why 19, 44, 69 and 94 perform the best overall, I'm not too sure. It seems like the happy middle ground. They are small enough and without many common factors that you get the benefits of having lots of multiples to pitch to, but they are large enough that they perform pretty well in the game sets with just one or two large numbers. Now remember, these scarier numbers appeared when the producers wanted to especially challenge their series champions. Do our results suggest that there is a more challenging collection of large numbers? Well, I think there are two interpretations. What makes a configuration challenging? I think for most of us, our intuition might tell us that these numbers are actually the most challenging because this is the set with the fewest possible number of solutions. With these large numbers, you are the least likely to be able to achieve a given target number. But then I thought maybe 1944, 69, 94 is the most challenging because with those numbers, you are most likely to be able to achieve the target. Maybe it's more challenging and more competitive if the expectation is that you should be able to achieve the target, especially as those numbers are still pretty nasty to work with. One final point is this. Let's say we have a target that lends itself really well to being close to a multiple of one of the traditional large numbers. Well, in the way that we've configured these other options of large numbers, we can always make one of the traditional large numbers by doing a subtraction. A really interesting follow-up question is then, what about collections of large numbers like this? A totally unconstrained selection of four numbers in the range from 11 to 100. How do they fare? Well, there are 90 numbers in that range and we need four of them, so there are 90 choose four equals 2,555,190 different options. And that's more than I could take into account with my analysis because my code took about 90 minutes to run per selection. So if I wanted to run through every possible option, then it would take me 438 years of computing time. Or if you prefer the alternate units, 67 countdown hosts worth of time. Now clearly I could speed this up with a bit of parallel processing, but I wonder if there's a more efficient method. And that is my challenge to you. Can you find the percentage of possible games from a given selection of arbitrary large numbers? Remember, these all have to be between 11 and 100, and all four of them must be distinct. And we're considering all game sets which contain at least one large number. One optimization I can think of off the top of my head is that once we've worked out the number of possible solutions among all game sets which contain 11 and 5 smalls, we never need to do that again. So in all of these sets of large numbers, which contain 11, we've already done some of the work and we don't need to repeat that for every game set which contains 11. Still, I'm sure there are smarter ways of doing this. So if you think you have a good method, give it a go and then email me via my website with your solution.
solution. I would love to hear from you. And if I get some good answers, I'll follow up in a future video with those solutions and give the solvers a shout out. Now, before we wrap up, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm not the first person to analyze this countdown game in this level of detail. As is always the case in mathematics, there are truths and there are right answers, and upon solving a problem, you realize that you weren't the first person to do it. But I'll link to some blog posts in the description. One of them I really, really like, and it involves the use of reverse Polish notation to calculate the space of all reachable numbers from a given game set, which is quite different to the approach that I took, and to be honest, seems like a smarter way of doing it. So in conclusion, I don't know really, I just rambled about countdown for half an hour. Usually I like to end the video and sum up with a larger, broader point, but in this case I don't think there is one. I just like countdown, and I just like maths. I hope you enjoyed the journey. Thank you as always for watching. A little bit different this time, usually I like to make videos on theory or history, but this time I just wanted to kind of pick a problem and solve it and share my solution. I hope you enjoyed it, even if it was a little bit different. Thank you so much to my patrons. You are really keeping the channel alive and giving me the incentive to carry on making videos. I've got tons of videos in the pipeline, so please make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss them. And if you want to support me, you can find the link to my Patreon down below. I would really appreciate it. If not, don't worry about it. Just subscribe and share the video. That would really help me out as well. This has been another Proof from the Run of the Roof. I'll see you next time. You can count on it.